Yeah, thanks a lot for that nice introduction. I'm very happy to speak at this mini symposium today. And my talk is going to be, um, as uh, has already been said by Luisian, about schizophrenia, which is not necessarily a neurological disorder, but um, we have some very specific ideas to what might be happening in um, the brain or in, in, in the circuits of schizophrenic patients. And today we're going to uh, yeah, be discussing uh, working memory dysfunction and how we can model it in these people. Oh, let me see. So this work that I'm presenting today is um, published in as of last year. So if there's any details that you want to read up on, um, I'm inviting you to take a look. Um, all right. So given that we are um, together with Albert and Joao, who are the co-authors, our computational neuroscientists, um, we want to understand working memory from a point of view that makes us, yeah, that, that enables us to model this cognitive behavior actually. And this is why when we study working memory in the laboratory, we use a very simple working memory task, such as this one. So this is a typical task that um, people are studying for these computational models. A subject, subject sees a stimulus on a screen. So in this case, the stimulus value that is of importance is um, the position, which is an angular position on the screen. Then the subject has to remember this position throughout a delay of several seconds. And finally, there's a response that is even either given by an eye movement or by um, a cursor movement of a mouse. A typical behavior that we see in this kind of task is that um, the longer the delay, the less precise responses are in um, this kind of yeah in this kind of setup. So you can see here from actually from a primate study um, from the late 80s how um, the spread around the targets that have been shown on the screen gets larger and larger throughout the delay. There are different reasons why that might be, um, and I'm, I will call them different sources of response variability because what we're uh, fundamentally studying when we're studying working memory errors is this response variability. So one could be that um, participants forget about the memories that could be due to very long delays, or there might be several memory items so that um, the load is higher than what the subject can remember, but also we could introduce distractors over the delay period. Then um, there are other errors such as swap errors. So these are confusions between several items that have been shown. Um, and then there are more subtle um, errors or subtle sources of response variability, such as for example, biases um, that could be um, of the, so it's a response bias towards, for example, cardinal directions, but also to previously shown items such as observed in serial effects. And then finally, um, there's another source of variability that is not explained by any of these systematic sources of error, which is just a diffusion process of memory. So we assume that memories just get less precise over the course of the delay. What I want to mention as a aside, but I think it's really important, whenever we want to study working memory, we should actually um, look ideally at effects that increase over the time of the delay, because we're mostly interested in what neural processes are enabling um, the maintenance of memories throughout the delay. All right, so let's move on to schizophrenia and see which of these sources of variability are actually uh, affected in patients, in persons with schizophrenia. So the findings here and the studies that have been conducted mostly focus around precision, um, which can be um, a, yeah, which, which we usually study as a result of response, uh, of, of neural, of, of diffusion of memory, sorry. Then um, there is distractibility, capacity, and serial biases. So what we see here is that patients with schizophrenia have less precise responses, especially as delays get longer. Um, they also show a higher distractibility and a lower capacity in working memory. And finally, we have recently shown um, this very specific effect where trial to trial dependencies between responses are, or be between responses and memory items are um, disrupted in these patients. So they have a, a less bias towards previous responses than healthy controls, which is actually interesting because it can show us that sometimes there is a source of response variability that is actually lacking in patients rather than, um, yeah, than that working memory is impaired. 
So um, how can we now try to model these working memory deficits? I think the first step here should be to ask how we can model working. And a very useful uh, framework for this are attractor models as in general for, for, for modeling memory. And so what we want to do is to, oh yeah, sorry. So basically these attractor models, they have been um, yeah, founded upon a, a, a very important observation, also from this primate study from, from the late eighties, where researchers have recorded neurons in prefrontal cortex. Um, and then they have presented stimuli at different um, locations on the screen. And what they found was that these neurons that um, they were recording were uh, tuned to specific stimuli. That's this you can see that by the fact that this neuron responds most strongly for this upper left location. And then a second important feature here is that neurons were active throughout the whole delay period. So they were keeping um, this persistent stimulus specific activity. Now we can model this um, in a PFC circuit model. Um, where we again have a few key ingredients that will reproduce this kind of um, spiking pattern. First of all, we need uh, neurons that are tuned to a stimulus, so their response will be strongest to specific stimulus. And then the second important thing here is that we have this, um, this uh, excitatory recurrent connectivity in the network that has a specific profile so that uh, connectivity is stronger between neurons with similar preferred locations on the screen. What we get out of this is that when the network is stimulated, um, such as it, it is here, when a stimulus comes into the network, um, we'll have activity of a subgroup of neurons that code for that stimulus. And as the delay goes on, activity is going to be, to be passed back and forth between neurons with similar preferred um, locations on the screen so that we have this local maintenance of the memory throughout the delay period. All right, so how can we explain, for example, working memory precision with these attractor models? So um, the answer to that is that we will look at the decoder of, um, of, of what memory has been held within a network throughout the delay period. And then we'll simulate this many, many times and see how the decoder changes throughout the course of the delay. And what we see here is that um, over many trials, there is a diffusion process that always goes to a different um, random direction. So this is like a random walk. And when we um, implement it, when we simulate it several times, we see that the spread um, of the different responses is getting higher and higher. And this is just the same as we have seen in the behavior before for um, this monkey study, but which we also saw in see in humans, of course, um, I, I want to mention this. Um, all right, so these attractor models are really, really powerful. Uh, in fact, we cannot only um, yeah, model these precision effects, but also um, it has been seen that distractibility um, of working memory is similarly modeled by them. Also capacity when we have several working memory items in the circuit. And finally, we have recently modeled um, serial bias to, um, yeah, to in, in conjunction with this finding in schizophrenic patients. <clears throat> So how can we use these models to understand schizophrenia? And the answer to that is that we will think about different biological hypotheses of schizophrenia, and then we'll implement them in a circuit model. And we can do this because models feature an abundant, yeah, well, uh, some biological detail that is really important and that um, we think is affected in schizophrenia. And this is what people have done to, in order to reproduce different working memory um, working memory aspects that are impaired in schizophrenia. So you can see from this list here that um, the most prominent models are NMDA receptor dysfunction, which could either affect excitatory or um, uh, E to E or E to I connections, and therefore can upregulate or downregulate the excitation to inhibition ratio. Um, we can get a similar effect with um, the dopaminergic um, receptor ratio. And then there's a different type of model that um, we have recently proposed for schizophrenia, which affects short-term plasticity um, in the network. So what we do when we touch upon all these um, different biological variables is that we get a different network behavior that resembles behavioral patterns observed in schizophrenia. And um, why do we get this? Well, um, the idea is that there are some attractor dynamics um, or like some, some properties of the dynamical system that change as we touch these biological variables. 
So for today's talk, I'm going to focus on precision um, and I'm going to focus on changes in excitation to inhibition um, that is being modeled by decreasing NMDA receptor, um, NMDA receptor function in the network. And so you can see here that E2I will, um, yeah, increasing or decreasing E2I can increase this diffusion process that underlies reduced precision. And the idea here is that this is because it changes the dynamical system. Um, and a useful uh, image to have in, head, in, in, in mind here are these attractor landscapes and how they change as we change the excitation to inhibition ratio. So when we decrease excitation in a network, um, the idea is that um, attractors get more shallow. And when we increase it, they should get steeper. And intuitively, this will translate to shallower attractors um, leading to less stable memory, less stable, yeah, less stable attractors and more memory diffusion. So less stable memories as well. Um, and of, of course the opposite would be true for deeper attractors. However, when we look back at the studies that have implemented changes um, in E to I ratio, we see that in fact, there is an amb ambiguity in modeling. So both increasing and decreasing the I ratio has led to decreased precision in uh, models of schizophrenia. So how do we explain this? Um, and specifically, how do we explain that disinhibition, so an increase in excitation in a network leads to higher diffusion or a higher um, yeah, rate of diffusion in the network and therefore to decrease precision. So we encountered this uh, puzzle or I encountered during my PhD several times. And um, when we wrote this uh, review, we started digging into the literature. Um, and what we found there was that in fact, there are more um, factors to the stability of working memories in these continuous, attract continuous attractor models than just the attractor strength. So in fact, um, Zach Kilpatrick and colleagues have performed these mean field analysis. And what they found is that the diffusivity of the, of the working memory along these different values that represent different memories is going to be modulated, first of all, by the attractor strength, which is what we would have intuitive, intuitively thought, but then also um, by the amount of noise that is in the input currents, um, and finally, by the spatial modulation of noise correlations. So this means that we're going to look at how strongly the noise is correlated between a neuron that is representing the memory item and um, other neurons in a network that are farther away from the tuned, the, the um, responsive neurons, so to say. All right, um, so we wondered whether these two extra factors that we usually don't consider might explain the inconsistencies that we are observing in the literature. Um, and what's most maybe worrisome about this is that as a computational psychiatrist, we usually tend to work with um, the model that seems biologically plausible, but apart from that, that has free code online or that our lab is working with usually. So in a sense, um, many, many, many choices of uh, many aspects of model selection are really somewhat arbitrary because of course we don't know all the biological variables to really determine which is the optimal model of the brain. So to study this point, we looked at two different models. Um, that both simulate working memory, and we looked at the diffusion of memories in these two models. The first model um, is, has been used by John Murray and colleagues um, in these two studies, but also by us. Um, and this is like a classical model to, the, yeah, used in computational psychiatry. And then the second model um, is a somewhat, somewhat more exotic model for, for some choices that have been made. Um, it hasn't been used in computational psychiatry, but that might also be um, a legit choice that we might want to make. So here I'm listing some of the differences between these two. And you will see from this list that some aspects are more biologically plausible in model two, and others are more biologically plausible in model one. So the key difference is that model two is uh, generating its noise internally. Um, this is due to a sparse and random connectivity in the network. Um, whereas model one has symmetric all-to-all -all connectivity. But then on a biologically plausible side, it is modeling uh, saturating NMDA receptors and also conductance-based synapses, which model two is not doing. All right, so now if we look at how variable the decoder is um, for each of these two models over the course of the delay, 
when we touch upon the EI ratio in the network, we see that these two models give just opposite predictions. So let me walk you through this figure. We have um, the vari variance of the decoder. So basically this is telling us in different trials how far did the memory drift apart from the initial position. Um, in gray is a control condition. And then we change the NMDA receptor um, the NMDA receptor parameter on E2I connections, which increases excitation in network. This leads to higher diffu diffusivity in the model one, um, but lower diffusion in the in model two. So in fact, we have this, this really um, opposing effect by just an arbitrary model choice. So can we explain this? Um, and of course we can. So I'm just um, giving you again, like this formula that has been seen in the mean field analysis. And we now estimate these three quantities from the firing rates of our mod of, uh, of um, our, our two different models during working memory. The first thing to look at is the activity. So here I'm showing you the activity of um, our, all our different neurons when a stimulus is shown at 180 degree. And you can see that um, the qualitative change of increasing or decreasing EI ratio um, is very similar um, for these two models. So we have a stronger attractor or a stronger memory when increasing excitation, both from model one and model two. So this is not really explaining why diffusivity is different. We can say the same about the noise level that is being measured um, at each one of these neurons. So again, we have somewhat different uh, shapes um, of, 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 of these curves here. But overall, the pattern is that um, E2E, uh, decreased excitation in network, suffers le less from this um, manipulation um, for both of the models. So qualitatively, again, we have the same prediction. However, now when we look at um, the spatial modulation of our noise correlations, we see that the two different models are giving fundamentally different um, patterns here. So in particular, when we increase excitation network, this blue curve, um, we get a very, very strong spatial modulation of uh, noise correlations, whereas this is very small for the red curve. And in model two, um, there is not really a big difference between um, the three conditions. And you will see that this factor is in, in this formula here as a delta C. So this will increase our diffusivity for the blue condition in model one, but not for model two. This is exactly what is happening and what is giving us this um, superior decoder variance for um, a disinhibited network in model one, but not in model two. So imagine this would have been a computational psychiatry study um, where we just choose arbitrarily one of these two models, we could really argue that whatever effect we find in schizophrenia can be captured by the model. And this is a worrisome um, result. What's more is that we don't actually know what are the effects of, of schizophrenia or of its pharmacological models on these variables. And so we can't really inform our model selection in a way that would tell us, okay, when noise correlations look like this, then we should probably um, choose model one over model two or the other around. So model selection is still arbitrary um, and we need more experiments that um, will measure these three quantities in order to tell us um, how, to, how to proceed. So um, I'm, I'm not going to talk a lot about the experimental um, suggestions that we make. You can read about them in um, this review. I think what's most important, as I just said, is like the, characterizing these three quantities during working memory and not in just baseline conditions in pharmacological experiments. Um, and I'm going to leave you with this um, warning speech, so to say. Um, and I want to thank my collaborators on this project, Zhuang, who's been a PhD student, in the lab um, at the same time as me and Albert, who's been my um, PhD supervisor. So thanks. Great, thank you, uh, Heike. That was a really interesting talk. Um, yes, are there any uh, questions from the audience? You can either just unmute or ask in the chat. Okay. Oh. Oh. Hello? 
Hi. Hi. Uh, yes, uh, I have a question. Uh, thanks a lot for this uh, very nice talk, and you you're raising here a very important uh, point. And uh, I uh, I have a maybe I missed something, but uh, what uh, I think is that the the two model you present has not been first developed for this purpose. So there is a kind of shift in the function of the model. So you have models that have been developed for a specific uh, purpose, and then you try to reuse it uh, for another application. And uh, so how in such a case we can say, okay, is this, uh, we are not out of the assumption of the, of the way of the model has been developed, how we, we match. And if you would have uh, developed a specific model to your specific purpose, would you think it would have been better and why? Yeah, that's an interesting question. Thank you. Um, so let me go back to the models just so you have the references. Um, it's true that model one is um, basically a very similar model to um, Comte 2000, which I have introduced in the beginning. Um, yeah, this one. So it's, it's true that this is not actually a model that has been developed for schizophrenia. However, we can kind of um, make predictions about what would happen in schizophrenia due to this mechanistic idea of which um, parts of the model would break down. So this model is modeling GABA, AMPA, and NMDA receptors. And um, due to the hypothesis in schizophrenia that NMDA receptors are dysfunctional, um, this seems like a plausible thing to, to try in this model. And then, um, yeah, it's true that um, Murray et al. have actually used this for schizophrenia and this is published. And in the Hansa and Mato paper, this has never been used for computational psychiatry purposes. Um, yeah. I hope that kind of answers your question. Yes, I think it's a more so. fundamental concern that you have than, than what I could answer. Thanks. I see there's also a question in the chat. Um, I'll just read it out loud and then you can um, answer how I can. In model two, when the noise is said to be internal, what does it mean for the modeling? Okay, so this means that we're not injecting noise externally, um, but rather um, this noise is already in the network. So, so in, in, in model one, basically we have some connections that are external um, to, 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 our, to our neurons in the network, um, which is just like some, some, some random um, activity that is being fed in. And in model two, we don't have that. So I guess when you're, you're changing the, the noise input in the later uh, slides, you're changing some parameter that determines the magnitude of the noise in model two. Uh, the model one is actual inputted. Right. Okay. Noise. That's a good point. Maybe, uh, yeah, maybe I didn't make that really clear. So I think at some point I'm saying that this is um, noise and input currents, but that doesn't actually mean that it's external noise. This means that for each neuron, um, all the inputs it receives from the network itself. So basically, it's not. Um, yeah, it's like the um, noise from from other neurons that form part of um, of the of the circuit. All right. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks. Any more questions from uh, the audience? If not, then uh, thank you again, Heike. It's a very nice, yeah. uh, very nice presentation. Thank you. And um, Luciana, you can go ahead and introduce next speaker.